Okay, so this breakout session is called What's More Important, Your Zip Code or Your Genetic Code? So if you're not in the right room, uh, you should leave now. But I promise if you leave, you're going to miss probably the best breakout in the whole conference here. Um, my name is Matthew Nagato. I am the Communications Director for the Hawaii Primary Care Association. Uh, although I suspect I was asked uh, to moderate today's uh, breakout session because I'm also the writer and the producer of a documentary on health in Hawaii called Ola. And it is a documentary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a documentary film which examines the social determinants of health, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, despite all of the focus of healthcare transformation on uh, the clinical model, whether it's at the practice level or at the IT level, or the focus on the financial aspects, insurance and payment reform. Despite all of the focus of transformation on these two areas, uh, there is a wealth of global data showing pretty conclusively uh, that social factors have a significant effect on the health of our population. So that requires us uh, to change our thinking on what it means to be healthy, but also what is effective health policy. And so we're very, very fortunate today uh, to hear from the Hawaii State Department of Health Federal Reserve Bank, and the University of Hawaii School of Hawaiian Knowledge, and they'll be discussing uh, what they're doing to expand our definition of what it means to be healthy. Um, we are going to have all three of the speakers present uh, consecutively, so we'll hold all of the questions to the end. If you've been to other breakout sessions, this is old news to you. Um, I will ask a few questions of the panel after all three of them have spoken, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions from the audience. If you do have a question, please remember to use uh, the freestanding microphone here in uh, the middle of these two rows here, because the session is being recorded. We want to make sure we pick up both the question and the answer. OK. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have three distinguished speakers. Loretta Fuddy is the director of the Hawaii State Department of Health, where she served our community as a champion for vulnerable populations uh, for over 30 years. And her dedication to health equity is encouraging a greater integration of health in all policies at the department. We also have David Erickson, who is the director of the Center for Community Development Investments at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where he leads its effort to meld community development with health policy. His book on community development is called The Housing Policy Revolution, Networks and Neighborhoods. And if you haven't read the book, I highly encourage you to read it. I just got an opportunity to see it a couple weeks ago. It's amazing. And I'm not getting paid for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, finally, Maynette Benham is a Kanaka Maoli scholar and educator, as well as an accomplished author. She is a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where her strong leadership on culture-based education is helping to heal the gaps that have existed in health policy for far too long. So uh, now, without further delay, it is my honor to introduce the first of our speakers and a good friend, Loretta Fuddy. Good afternoon, everyone. Of course, the answer to the question is, it's your zip code, right? You all know that. If you're in this room, it's because of the zip code. <laughs> and that's, that's the most important thing that, that we need to, to look at. Um, so again, thank you, for Matthew, for allowing us to, to share some thoughts. I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the Department of Health. Um, when we talk about Affordable Care Act, uh, much of what you've heard today relates to the clinical side of things. Um, we're really about population-based health and prevention. So we're going to be looking at that. So the social determinants of health, um, when you look at that, these are the conditions in which we're born, we grow in, we live in, we work, um, and we age. And that these are the pieces that really shape our lives and shape our health. So we're lo really looking at the dynamic interaction among the behavioral, clinical um, policy piece. Um, we're looking at social systems. We're looking at the economics of things so that we know that, that poverty um, and where we live, our educational background has more to say about our health condition than our genetic pieces. 
So from the Department of Health perspective, when I came into my position, of course, all new directors put together a strategic plan. Our plan is the five foundations for healthy generations. The number one cornerstone is looking at eliminating disparities and improving the health of all groups throughout Hawaii. And really, the only way we're going to do that is by addressing those social determinants. And so it is more about improving access to care. It is about improving quality of care. It is looking at interventions from a, a cultural lens, a community lens. Um, and for a lot of what we do in the Department of Health is that we look at populations that um, were the safety net. And a lot of that has to do with stigma. So we're going to be focusing a little bit later in my presentation on specifically behavioral health, because there's a lot of stigma still around that. So you've seen this before. Um, the local perspective is looking upstream. Disease is downstream. But if we're really going to look at prevention, we need to back it up. We need to look at um, community. We need to look at income insecurity. We need to look at um, high school education, physical activity, um, behaviors like not smoking. These are the kinds of things that really form the foundations for our health. And so these are the most important things that, that we look at. So with progress within our department, in 2001 I came in, we set, set our um, strategic plan. Um, we have been moving forward with that. A lot of what we have been doing is trying to get the word out, partnering with Primary Care Association, partnering with Matthew, um, and really looking at um, establishing within the department an Office of Health Equity and laying down those foundations and looking at working with other partners. Related to the Affordable Care Act is the community health needs assessments and really working with um, Healthcare Association of Hawaii and all the hospitals on um, putting together we're one of only two states that have a statewide um, community health needs assessment. The next step is moving towards a state health improvement plan. The last plan that we had for overall health and well-being was back in the 80s, and that's a shame. We really, at this point in time, need to say, you know, it's not just about Affordable Care Act, it's about community health, and how do we drive that? And we can only drive that by looking at health and all policy and working with our sister agencies and the community. Um, from an internal perspective, we have been looking at, at training within our own uh, staff and um, really codifying, we are going to introduce legislation this year that will actually put in state statute a definition around health equity and the social determinants. Um, and one of the main things that we do in Department of Health is looking at data and surveillance because we want to document not only the health of the community, but what contributes to that health and are we making progress and doc documenting that progress. Um, so some of the strategies um, for gives you an example of health in all policy. Uh, we looking at safe streets. Um, walkable communities, using EBT cards for farmers markets, working with telebehavioral health, um, smoke-free um, uh, housing projects, looking at blood pressure retraining. But if you're looking at cost of not addressing behavioral health, this is the one thing that we wanted to focus on today was integration of behavioral health with primary care. And the one reason for that is that our behavioral health clients um, have a lot of stigma around them, but they also have um, great disease. And we can see that the cost of depression and anxiety can be as high, as, much higher as uh, 5,700. Um, and so that's the burden that they bear. So some of the problems that we're looking at is, again, looking at how can we get them up front? How can we integrate behavioral health with primary care? 
and addressing those things among our behavioral po health populations, such as smoking, obesity, alcohol use, um, infectious disease. We have a project working with um, Kalihi Palama Health Center, um, and this is a joint project where we will, at our um, Lana Kila Health Center, we address the behavioral health needs as well as the, um, the physical needs of the patient. And it's not costing us a lot of money. Um, it, it's just a matter of creating the structure for that. Other states have proven this has uh, really worked and that they have saved dollars. We need to document that in Hawaii. Our plan is to take it out to other um, community behavioral health centers and to do continued integration with our community health centers. So the change we need in Hawaii is really that shared goal of health improvement. It is emphasizing the role of public health and working with other systems. It is working with education, with the tax structure, with housing, um, and using our epidemiology to drive um, some of these changes. Um, we're very happy to be working with the Federal Reserve Bank, and I'm quite amazed that they understand the social determinants of health. Um, and better than many other, some people in the clinical side of things. So we're very happy that we're engaging community and beginning to move forward. Again, we'll continue to focus in our own shop on looking at workforce development and looking at community health workers and how we can get that message out. So that's kind of what we are about, and I think I'll, I'll stop there, so give a chance to the other panelists, and then we'll take questions. Thank you. Great, thank, thanks, uh, and uh, it's great to be here. We have, um, we've been doing a series of conferences with uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation at uh, different reserve banks around the country, and we just did one in Minneapolis, and NPR was there, and the local television station um, was there. It, it picked up the NPR story, at, and then the zip code is more important than the genetic code. Catch kind of really got their attention, and so they went, there's two zip codes in Minneapolis where the difference in life expectancy is about 13 years. So they went to interview someone uh, in Minneapolis about you know what it was like to live in one and the other. And they went to the one where the life expectancy was shorter, and they asked the guy, well, what do you think about that? And he said, well, I'm moving to that other zip code. <laughs> so, uh, so this is it's great to be on this panel. And uh, uh, I do want to mention that the, the, the remarks I'm going to make today are my own and not uh, representing the Federal Reserve, per se. Um, but uh, also, uh, and I also want to mention, I'm going to just race run through these slides. It's about a 22-minute presentation that I'm going to do in 10 minutes. So um, I apologize in advance for speaking quickly. Um, if you're interested and in, want to kind of revisit some of the themes that I touch on here, I would encourage you to go, you could just Google this. On, it's, on, it's on YouTube, a talk I gave at the Mayo Clinic a couple months ago that this one, this, 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 this presentation is based on. So if you just Google my name and Mayo Clinic Transform 2013, you'll get uh, the longer version. So let me jump in. Um, I think what we do, this is, a, this is a topic that's been coming up several times today, uh, the idea that the problem is that we, even though we spend quite a bit of medical care, we have worse health and shorter lives. And in fact, you know, maybe for those of you who know Richard Wilkinson's work and this, the book, The Spirit Level, you know that a middle class Swede is healthier than even a wealthy American. So there's something very wrong going on with the way we have things set up. And it's not because there's not a lot of money being spent, right? So here's, this puts a, this is a chart, I know this is kind of hard to read, but shows how um, the United States spends about $8,000 per person per year on medical care, and yet our health outcomes are about the same level of, people, of countries that spend half to a third of that much money. And part of the reason why I put this slide in this, in, in this presentation is to show that just there's, there's, there seems to be a lot of inefficiencies, potentially, that, that we could sort of, there's money in the system, in other words. Um, this has been a problem for a long time, and it's getting worse. So the United States, in life expectancy in 1980, was 15th, and now we're 27th. Um, you know that's 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 serious, um, and 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 so we think about you know how are we going? What's the lever that we can push against to sort of improve that, make things better, and try to turn the situation around? 
I thought before I got, before I was schooled in the, school, the social determinants of health, um, and it took me a long time to get it, but I got it. Um, but before that, I would think, would someone say, why were there causes of premature death? I would say they either had bad medical care or some lack of access to medical care. But then, of course, there's a whole sort of, um, there are bookshelves and libraries on this, with studies on, on this issue, and the one I'm highlighting here is the McGinnis study <clears throat> that looked at causes of premature death and found that medical care only explained about 10% of the examples of premature death. Um, in many more cases, what you found were things like environmental exposure, if you were to, next to sort of a toxic source of some type of, a, 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 um, like an incinerator of some sort, something like that, a factory. Uh, you had social circumstances of, explained about 15%. Here you might think of something like the, the incident in uh, the heat wave in Chicago where so many uh, elderly uh, people died, not because there wasn't an alternative policy that was in place to help them because they could go to cooling stations and they would have been, they would have been sa safe there, but they were socially isolated and that's why they didn't, they, no one knew to go check on them. Uh, behavioral patterns, we've talked about this before, but you know, this is you know, making the easy, choice, the, the, the easy choice the healthy choice. That's something that's very hard to do in many neighborhoods, whether it's crime or lack of access to fresh food or other things keep you from exercising. These are the things that, that really enhance, that, it, that influence that behavioral pattern piece, which is 40%. And then even the genetic predisposition, there you can sort of say, well, that's kind of the luck of the draw. This is just the way your, 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 um, your, your genes kind of came together. But in fact, as we know more and more from things like epigenetics, that in many cases, like a, a, the toxic stress in, that you might experience in a, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous neighborhood might start turning on some of those bad genes. Uh, and, and, and something that you were predisposed to but may not have ever experienced will get triggered in, in, a, in a toxic and a stressful environment. And so what, you start to, what this starts to explain or what really dawned on me is that health can really happen in neighborhoods. And that's why the answer to, this, to the question of the panel is that your zip code is much more important than your genetic code. These are some examples of uh, life expectancy across certain neighborhoods. This is Washington, D.C. I'm just going to skip through a couple of these. Um, the, the, it's even among the worst is in uh, New Orleans where the life expectancy is, is 25 years between neighborhoods that are very, very close in proximity. And this is true every sing in every single place that we go and have these conferences. And I guess sort of my stethoscope moment, you know, we sort of that paradigm shift or where you really sort of think about the world differently is with those of us who work in community development really thought that if you could sort of figure, figure out, if you could get access to capital, if you get the buildings right, we thought we could solve the problem, right? And it really was, uh, it took a long time for me to kind of come to the realization. And I didn't understand what health was. I didn't, I have no training in it. I don't, I have no background in it. I, I'm married to a pediatrician, so I know I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of a connection to it, but that's about it. And um, what we found was, I mean, what, what finally became clear to me was that, that uh, our bodies are the sum record of our challenges and opportunities. And for too many Americans, they live in an environment, a neighborhood where there are too many challenges and too few opportunities. So those of us who work in community development really focus on these things. The things that can get under your skin, like uh, the high, you know, reading scores at uh, third grade are one of the best predictors of future health, right? So if you don't have a good school in your neighborhood, that's gonna affect your health. Having access to fresh food and not just a, a liquor store or something like that. Um, high quality housing that's been, that, that, that where you feel safe and where you don't need, where you can afford it so you don't need to sort of stay ahead of the landlord by moving from apartment to apartment. Things like access to a good paying job, transportation that connects you to a larger economy, and opportunities to exercise. These are the things that really contribute to health and these are the things that community development can bring and enhance communities. And that's really sort of, as much as I want to sort of talk about the, um, the uh, sort of so, some of the stuff is like a, is, is a, a downer, but in fact, this is, this is the good news part of the story, which is I think we have some tools, we have some approaches that can actually make some really important interventions. One, um, Matthew was very kind to say something nice about my book. He and my mother are the two people in the whole world who've read it, apparently. <laughs> um, but I appreciate that. Uh, but this is a book I wrote a few years ago. It's on, the, it's called, it's focused, the title's on housing, but that's, it's really about community development uh, writ large. And it's, it's, um, it's a discussion about how uh, a top-down sort of Washington-based bureaucracy uh, approach to anti-poverty work got replaced by this, what we call the community development network over time. This really starts in the 1980s, but now is in full 
full swing. In, in affordable house, uh, sorry, in community development, we do things like we build affordable housing, provide capital um, to small businesses, financing for community facilities like charter schools, clinics, shelters, federally qualified health centers. Um, we, the community development has a really interesting approach in the sense that it can harmonize multiple different funding streams. So if you look at any one of these deals, they are super complicated. But what you find is they find ca access uh, capital from uh, government, from banks, from, from other invest, investors, uh, from ph philanthropy, and they can, they can, they're able to bring all of this together into one deal, and that's really important piece of this story that community development can, is able to do that. The other part is that's really important to keep in mind is that it's, it can really do these sort of, um, it can, it can build on local knowledge, but then t tap into these larger systems. One of my favorite examples of this is that um, the affordable, uh, senior housing, affordable housing program uh, that HUD runs is called the HUD 202 program. Very romantic title. And uh, in that program, they have one design, and it's in every city. I'm sure there's several of them in Honolulu. Um, there's one in, near my house in San Francisco. It, it looks like it's one design. It looks like a cross between a hospital and a prison and uh, that was designed by Stalin's architect. I mean, it's like the ugliest thing you can imagine, and it just one, that's it, that's all they built, right? What you find in community development is that using things like the low-income housing tax credit, um, when they build affordable housing, they, they take a different approach, and so one of my favorite examples of, of kind of tailoring it to local needs is uh, an effort in, um, in, in the East Bay in San Francisco where this is a primarily um, Japanese uh, area, Japanese uh, immigrants had lived in this one neighborhood, and uh, the, the nonprofit was building the, 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 the apartment building, and they said, well, what do, you, what do you want? And there was a big complaint because there's, these are all older Japanese ladies, and they're saying, we just can't, these, American kitchens are the the, the 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 counters are too high. You know we can't we can't use we can't work in these kitchens, and so they made these kitchens with much lower countertops so that it would really be tailored to the needs of that community. And what I love about that story is that they also had a you know a a, a German pension fund providing the, the you know the long term uh, mortgage on that. So as you, what you they were able to sort of tailor something that's very specific to the needs of the local community, but then tap these larger systems. I mean really. Look, national subsidy programs, even even global capital markets in order to sort of execute on it. And I think that's another piece that community development brings to the table that is kind of unusual and not known by most people. I'm going to just skip to these examples. Affordable housing, three million apartments built for uh, housing about 10 million people in this country. This project is in San Francisco. It's for formerly homeless people. It's got um, uh, uh, offices for caseworkers and nurse practitioners who help keep keep an eye on on uh, on the residents and, and keep keep them uh, healthy. What San Francisco's experience is a dramatic when they started putting a huge investment in this type of housing for homeless people. They had a dramatic savings at their San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, and in fact, this program is now saving the city money. These are, this is an example of small business financing. So this is a project in San Diego called uh, Market Creek Plaza. It's, um, it was, was a very heavily contested uh, gang area. Um, and so the, uh, the developer of the properties basically started going out and just finding gang members on the street and saying, hey, I want to talk to your boss. And they and they brought the person back, so, they, so they're at like gang headquarters and saying, "We want to build this, but it's got to be a violence-free place. What do you want in exchange for this for this being neutral ground?" They said, "We want jobs for our members," and they promised that and delivered on that. Um, most of the people in this area live are from southern Mexico, so you can see that the architecture is really reminiscent of uh, sort of uh, it looks like Palenque or some you know one of these Mayan temples. And so they were real. And this is another example. This is CRA motivated bank did the did the loan on this. Um, you had uh, some foundations involved, but in, in general, and, and the New Markets Tax Credit Program, another one of the sort of stalwart programs of, of the community development industry. But it's one of those things, again, where you were sort of tailoring the needs to the local community based on these, these tools that are in the toolbox. This is an example of a, a charter school built with community development finance. It's called. It's run by the Knowledge is Power program by uh, two alums from the uh, Teach for America group. Very successful program, in uh, particularly targeted to low-income kids. Um, and then just one of the reasons I just want to show you this picture is that sort of what what that building just really represents. When that kid walks in that building, it says to that kid. You live in a society that cares about you and is expecting a lot from you, and that's something that I think community development can really, when these high-quality products can, uh, projects can deliver. They're also, I don't have photos of it, but grocery stores and food deserts, clinics, uh, federally qualified health centers, and other facilities are, are also what community development finances. 
And at root, what we're trying to do is attack the corrosive effects of poverty and poor health uh, with community development as an intervention. Um, this is a heat map showing, and this is Los Angeles County. On the left is economic hardship. On the right is prevalence of childhood obesity. And this is just sort of making that point as, 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 as powerfully as I think I can make it, which is that those of you who work in health and those of us who do anti-poverty work are working side by side, often in the same communities, but we don't really know each other. And that's really where I want to sort of get to is that this idea that community development and health can be brought together, but that I think this is going to be, it, this is the first step on a journey where we have to bring in a lot of other groups um, together, where we bring in education, public safety, economic development, community empowerment, and other groups to make sure this, this works. Um, I am out of time, so I'm just going to say that one, one piece of this is that the, um, the need for this is growing. The number of people who are going to be entering uh, age six, be 65 or over is going to double in the next 40 years. That's going to put tremendous stress on the medical care system. It's going to put tremendous stress on the, on the budgets of, of, of the federal government, state governments. Um, the other piece that I think is important about this slide, too, in terms of demographics is what people don't realize is that Social Security, so I turn 45 and I want to retire, you know, what happens is, you know, that's a, that's, you're supported by the, by the wages that people pay, uh, um, the workers that are working today pay for those who are retired today. Um, and in 1970, there were 3.6 workers per retiree. Today is about 2.8. In 2030, it's going to be 1.9, and one of those two is going to be black or Latino. We are not making the appropriate investments to make sure that they are super productive, each one of those workers, so that I can retire. <laughs> um, I'm going to hopefully we get into some of this um, in, in some of the questions and answers, but um, I think there are a lot of really exciting uh, 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 policy changes that are on the way. The ACA is clearly one of them, but there are others at the federal level, things like promised neighborhoods, choice neighborhoods, sustainable communities. Everybody is thinking in a more holistic way about the interventions that are necessary. We have a lot of these ideas uh, summarized in a book that we put together with the Low Income Investment Fund. It's available for free at whatworksforamerica.org. If you get on that website, we'll, we'll mail you out a copy. Um, and uh, this is my last slide here is this idea that what this is my this is my history of social policy of the last 50 years and what I was trying to, I, to, to get at here was that in the war on poverty, there was this holistic approach to what was needed in the neighborhood. It was really brilliant and divine, I mean, exactly right in terms of its concept, but it was very hard to execute given the institutions of that time. There was this great siloing that happened. This is where, you know, those who do federally qualified health centers and community development corporations, we were kind of brothers and sisters in the 60s, but we kind of lost track of each other. What we're really trying to get back. And, but we've all gotten better at our jobs over time, and what, that's, that's showing how these boxes get bigger. And what we're really trying to get at here is that in, in the challenge of today is to bring all of these sectors back together so we can do cross-sector, place-based interventions that really can make a difference for low-income people. So thank you very much for the chance to, to, to talk to you. And thank you. Thank you. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Uh. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, mahalo to uh, Matthew, Loretta, and David for, for setting um, such a high standard in, in presentations. I'm a little bit nervous here. Um, my name is Maynette Benham. I am the Dean of Hawaii Nuiakea School of Hawaiian Knowledge at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I wear two hats today. Uh, the first hat is as Dean and representing uh, my colleague deans at UH Manoa who are working on a Native Hawaiian health and well-being initiatives, several of them, and they include uh, the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, the School of Social Work, CTAR, the School of Law, and Hawaii Nui Ikea. I also wear the hat of, a trust, of trustee and chair of the Native Hawaiian Health Committee uh, for the Queen's Health Systems and Queen's Medical Center. So while I am not a health professional, um, serving in these two different capacities actually provides me with uh, the kuleana and really the, the opportunity to work with policymakers and, and governing boards to ensure the generation, the dissemination, the application of Hawaii, Hawaiian ike, kupuna ike, the knowledge of Hawaii to ensure that the vitality of our kanaka'aina uh, the vitality of our connections to our land um, also support the health and well-being of all the people who share and who live on our islands. 
I hope that uh, my presentation within the few minutes that I have uh, with you today will enhance the conversation that has already been presented. And I'm hopeful that uh, my, uh, my points will encourage you, perhaps uh, challenge all of you to adopt a more multifaceted and holistic view of health, acknowledge that improved wellness is definitely linked to health, and affirm that the work that you and I must do together is to search for actualized, complete physical, mental, social, spiritual, and environmental well-being. Um, so my brief comments this afternoon will urge all of you to take a look at the cultural specificities of health and well-being. I began pre preparing for this presentation by asking myself uh, one question, and that was, where does health and well-being appear, and where does it not appear? And very similar to my co-panelists, we will agree that where it appears is by zip code at least in the islands. But if you went to a presentation earlier this morning, colleagues, my colleagues presented uh, on Native Hawaiian health disparities, Dr. Palafox, Dr. Uh, Paloma, and Dr. Miyamoto, they talked about Native Hawaiian disparities, Pacific Island population disparities, and we actually have a report that was recently presented to the state legislature uh, several weeks ago, assessment and priorities for health and well-being in Native Hawaiians and other Pacific peoples. If you take a look at this, not only is health disparities uh, determined by your zip code, but is certainly um, defined by your race and ethnicity. And because of that, this is, in fact, a matter of social justice for me and for many of the colleagues that I work with. So what I'd like to do today is to present you with another way uh, to take a look at social determinants of health. And these are three key points that I'd like to quickly overview for you. I'd like to propose uh, a, a more, a different way of framing the way in which we look at social disparities, uh, social de determinants of health. I'd like us to start off by looking first at a, at a very fundamental Kanaka value, and that is the relationship of Kanaka Aina and the value of Aloha Aina. Once we talk a little bit about that, I'd like to propose a different view, a perspective, a model that we might be able to use in order to develop good policies, procedures, and programs that will support Kanaka Maoli and all people of Hawaii. And finally, if we go this route to this model that I will call abundance, so what? So what could we expect will happen? So let's first start off with this notion of kinship, this fundamental kahuahana, fundamental policy of kanaka ike, kanaka aina relationships. So from a culturally based perspective, we need to first of all consider the relationship that people have with the aina in which they, are, they live on. For Kanaka Maoli, Aina is everything that feeds us. The land, the sky, the ocean, the rivers, everything that nourishes us. We are in a reciprocal relationship with our Aina. So we take care of it, and it takes care of us. We believe that Aina is our first teacher. It is from Aina that we know who we are, who, where we came from, and the promises for our future. Kanaka Aina, kinship. The value from Kanaka Aina is the idea or the, the value of Aloha Aina. We use Aloha as a way of expressing love for one another. What more powerful value than Aloha Aina? our love for that which nourishes us. Remember this, land, 
is just land, it's just moku, it's just land. But when you place the kanaka on that moku, it becomes aina, because aina is where the spiritual, it's where the physical, it's where the mental well-being of who we are as people exists. So let's start with this notion of kanaka aina. If we come from this principle, then let me suggest that the model that we use is based on this notion of abundance. I argue much in much of the work that I do that poverty, health disparities, the language of that, the text of that is a learned behavior that prior to the coming of Western models and norms into this island, onto these islands, that Kanaka actually lived in abundance. They were a powerful, healthy communities of people. Abundance was at the core of everything on these islands. And over a course of historical events, that abundance was replaced by conversations and texts of poverty and disparity and illness. And much as what you all have already said, what we need to do is to reclaim and change that narrative. And how we do that is through a variety of what you've already identified as social determinants of health of looking at ways in which learning and teaching become core to our pre-K through post-secondary to community-based education. Learning that happens not only in schools, but happens in our oceans, in our streams, in our community centers, in our religious institutions. By really looking at the stories that everyone brings, our newest immigrants to these islands, the host culture of these islands, and those people who have lived here for generations. What are our stories? How do we connect? What food do we share? How can we work together? Another element has to do with Aina. We talked a little bit about that. Another one is Ohana. In the first slide, when I talked about Kanaka Aina, that was my daughter. When I moved back to Hawaii in 2008, I moved back because I needed my children to be in Aina, to be in a place where their ohana, their families and their extended families could tell them their stories so that they could choose to live a rich and healthy life. And then we come over to economic vitality because it is only through reclaiming our stories of abundance that we can be innovative, that we can engage in community-based development to build very innovative, out-of-the-box communities, and that we can be entrepreneurial. Now, so what? Well, I would posit that if we attend together to all of these social determinants of health and really build our families, our communities, that we will actually come to a place of power. An example of this recently was a partnership, part of our community engagement work at the University of Hawaii, but the University of Hawaii and Hawaii Nui Akea partnered with In Peace, which is a community-based organization on the Waianae Coast. They do keiki steps and stuff like that. With the Nanakuli School co uh, Complex, with Kamehameha School's Kapua Project, and with the Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center. And together, we put together a program called the Ohana Initiative, in which we bring mommies and daddies and grandmas and aunties and children together to learn the stories of their mo'oku'auhau, their genealogy, to learn the stories of their land, to learn how to treat their land better, to learn about school systems so that they can be advocates for good education, to learn about health care together as a family. Our, our first year, we had n nine families that, and I have to tell you just really quickly, we started off with nine families, and there, were only, there was only one dad who came. By the third session, all the daddies were showing up. 
And that's a success. Uh, we just started again the, the initiative, and we have 39 families and about 30 dads participating. So what's the result? The result can be healthier communities, people who are proud of who they are, um, and people who are producing abundant, abundant places. So mahalo. How about another hand for all of our presenters here today? <clears throat> You know, one of, the, uh, <laughs> one of the great crimes of these kinds of conferences and summits is it's like an endless parade of appetizers, right? <laughs> Where you just get a little taste of something that you really, I think, would like to absorb more of. And I think that goes for all three of the presentations here today. And I know it's not just me and, and my passion for this particular subject. Um, I'm going to ask the panel a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to questions from the audience. So while uh, we're doing the questions for me, if you do have a question, again, please go to the microphone here uh, on this side of the room so that we can make sure that we hear it for the recording. First question for the panelists, and this is for whoever wants to answer this. Um, the entirety of the rest of this conference is about healthcare transformation. And as I said in my opening remarks, uh, healthcare transformation, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, all the oxygen in the room is being taken up by discussions of payment reform and insurance access and uh, changes to patient-centered care and all of these things that are sort of the downstream clinical model aspects. We know, based not just on the presentations that you folks gave, but all of the research, we know that these social determinants of health are real, that they're meaningful, and that we need to start paying attention to them. Given the environment that we're in, where everyone is so focused on the clinical aspects, what can all of us do to more effectively convince not just the policymakers, but also all the other sectors of society that we need to start paying attention to some of these issues? So I'll start. Um, I, I too oftentimes get discouraged um, when we hear presentations like today because it is about 99% related to the clinical and often population health is said as 10 seconds and we quickly move back to the clinical side. Um, as a public health professional and all of you in, in the room here, I think we just continue to need to have the conversation and keep bringing it back to um, population-based health and bringing it back to the community. So one of the reasons why, for example, the Department of Health became engaged with all of our hospitals and the community needs assessment was not just so we could share the data, and it's not just so the hospitals can say, these are the health issues that we want to prioritize. It's helping them go to the next step. And I sort of liken it to that we've gotten them outside the front door, they're in the parking lot, but now we need to move them out into the community and to really talk with them about those strategies and bringing the resources they have in their clinical setting, getting out of the clinical setting and bringing that to the community and engaging in the community. In Hawaii, as you said, we're all about the aina, but also in Hawaii, we know we're also all about the relationship and we need to form those relationships with our brothers and sisters in the community. So I'm going to take the opportunity to, to hopefully say something provocative, uh, particularly with Regent G in the room from the University of Hawaii. <laughs> you know, at the University of Hawaii, we are a land-grant institution, which means that what we have to do is that we need to prepare uh, uh, specialists and, and doctors and attorneys and lawyers and public health specialists to work together in an integrative way in community. And I think that that's exactly what we are trying to do, at least at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, with the deans and the colleges that I just spoke about. And that is an example right there, that health assessment report, is what we need to do at the university is to really work together uh, to ensure that our, our, um, our new students, our, our new professionals, 
uh, know about each other's areas of expertise, can work together, and as well work in community in order to, to change the way in which we deliver um, care pretty much. Is that, is that good? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say just, I think things like your movie are really important and telling stories are important. And I think this, this idea that, um, and it sounds like, and there's such a rich tradition of that here that I think you can build on that and build bridges that way. The other thing that I think is really interesting is the, the probably the modern father of social epidemiology is a Berkeley professor, his name is Len Syme. And he's, he's this guy is old, like he's in his way 80s. And he says, you know, I've been doing this work for 50 years. I can never communicate it to anybody. And he says, what I've kind of, kind of come down to is this idea about bright eyes. He says, I can, you know, as much as I can, I can do your whole life history, your health history, I can know everything about you, I can know your zip code and your genetic code. He says, I don't need any of that. I can look into your eyes, and if you have bright eyes, if there's a spark there, if there's some engagement, you're going to live a healthy, long life. And all babies are born with bright eyes. And we're not doing a good enough job, you know, keeping them that way. How's that for an appetizer? <laughs> um, OK, uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, you talked about the, being in the zip code improvement business versus the healthcare business. And that involves uh, a totally different approach to community development. And I think here in Hawaii, one of the challenges that we face with doing effective community development is our very limited resources, but also our very special relationship to the land, to the aina and the very unique cultural mix that we have, both with the native Hawaiian culture, but also this uh, large potpourri of uh, immigrant cultures. So how do we go about creating effective, sustainable development that sort of respects all of these other factors that have limited us thus far to doing effective community development? You know, it's, it's um, I mean, that's part of why I took a little bit too much time to talk about those examples of the, you know, the, the kitchens that are sized right, yeah, um, is that community development really is uh, a network that, that can be interchangeable in terms of its parts. And so if you have a group that represents any, any subgroup, they're able to, they have a seat at the table and they have access to resources and they can be part of the conversation. So I think that's really important. And the, and the other piece, I think, too, is that we're just, we're just entering into an era now where everybody recognizes that we have to be cross-sectoral in our approach, that we have to sort of think more holistically about this work, that doing outputs is not enough, N number of apartments built or head start slots filled or what have you. I mean, we really have to get into the transformation of lives business, and that's something that's going to require all of us to start speaking more to each other and crossing those silos. So again, you know, I, I really think it's about getting back to the community. Um, and with, within public health, we work a lot with the community. And, it, and it's giving them the opportunity to come up with the strategies that they think works for their community. So it's not about being cookie cutter. Even though, you know, we have general templates, we say this is the best practice. But it's, again, taking that best practice and localizing it. What, do, what does that mean um, when we say that we want to have um, safe streets? Um, what does that mean to that one particular community? How do they define that? When we talk about healthy options, food options, what does that mean for them? Um, is it community gardens? Is it having more advocacy and working with the, the local grocers? Is it? Um, looking at our, our farm to, to market and engaging our agricultural community. But I think we have to engage at the community level, and, and I think that's where it makes more sense. Um, so rather than building from the, t the top down, it's really kind of grassroots up. I just, have, I just wanted to add one thing um, as I was listening to the responses. In the, um, the session that I attended before this, I think Dr. Palafox is here. Yes. Are you here, Neil? OK, yep. he's here. One of the things that he had talked about in his presentation was this idea that many times our communities have, don't have the right information. You know, and so we um, relate or we build relationships on misinformation. So I think when we begin to do our community-based engagement activities, our community development work, a part of that whole piece is really learning about each other 
and, and getting some of this information right so that we can begin to work together to, to create more powerful and sustained um, initiatives um, forward for not only the health of our, uh, our fiscal health, but our, our physical health, our, our community health. Okay, are there any questions from the audience? No one wants to go up and use the microphone. Would you rather write it on a card and I can read your question? <laughs> Matthew, can I answer just real quick? P yep. Part of the, this approach, you know, focusing on the community and, and, and having this, you know, having, keeping this dialogue going, one of the things that's going to cement this going forward too are, is, a, is a, a, a really important innovation around pay for success financing. And so this is something, we have a whole um, a collection of essays on this. If you Google Federal Reserve and pay for success, you'll get that. But it's really things like the social impact bond. Again, uh, there are a raft of these different vehicles, but if you incentivize the outcome rather than the output, then these strategies have to be employed. And that really brings people together because there's an incentive to do so. And, and we don't have time to necessarily talk about that, but I think that's something to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Super, thanks for sharing that. I thought I saw a hand somewhere. Was it you, David? Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's so great to, um, we've traded emails before, we've never met, so I'm glad to make this connection. And, uh, you know, we, we wrote this chapter in that book that I mentioned, Investing in What Works for America's Communities, and I see, you know, the places where it does work, where there's cross-sector work, and in almost every case, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, they use data, they set a vision, they get community buy-in, and the other common component is that there's, uh, behind the effort is a charismatic super genius, who has a close friend who's a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and when we, when we think about the charismatic super geniuses, David's name comes up quite often. And so it's just, you know, I think that's really important. If you can have somebody, you're lucky you have people like that here. We need to find the billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> But in some ways, the anchor institution can be the billionaire, and that's something where you know we were just um, we were just in New York um, at a uh, conference um, at the New York Fed, and there was uh, the person there in charge of the Greater New York Area Association of Hospitals, and he was just explaining. He said, "Look, I, I procure ten billion dollars worth of goods and services every year, and I want to support local businesses and social enterprises and and fight poverty in New York." And and here, but he doesn't know who to talk to. I mean, there's just so many connections not being made right now. We're just scratching the surface. Surely somebody in this room has Pierre Omidyar's phone number. <laughs> no? Why don't you say your question? I'll repeat it over there. But 
this requires sacrifice from those who have resources. And people, you know, like to talk about cooperation in theory. In practice, they sometimes behave very selfishly. They don't really to want to take care of our own. We don't really want to share those resources. Uh, um, and David talked about well, housing as a solution in San Francisco. I live there sometimes. And I know that that would be an ideal solution. But housing also requires education. You, you know, you just can't put people within homeless into housing and expect them to understand how to take care of themselves. So you need a lot of education to go with it. Sure. Otherwise, it becomes a self-educated so, uh, problem in a few years' time. I mean, that happens in Chicago. So anyway, I don't know the answer. How do you know the question? Well, let me try to rephrase the question very quickly, because we actually are out of time. But uh, I think that sort of follows along with the first question I asked, that in this era of resource contention, how do we foster, I think someone mentioned, a culture of reciprocity? How do we foster that culture so that people are able to make decisions that are in the interest of sort of the greater good, as opposed to just the people in their own zip code? I mean, re really quick, one thing, we spend a lot of money, but on the wrong things. So, you know, they, people often talk about um, prison as, is, as expensive, sending, keeping someone in prison for years is as expensive as sending them to Harvard. That's actually not true. Um, in this first uh, Rikers Island example of social impact bond in New York City, it's four times more expensive than Harvard to keep somebody <laughs> in prison. Um, so you think about, I mean, one special ed slot is as expensive as a whole classroom. Um, and a lot of kids are arriving in school not because of uh, needing special ed, not because of some cognitive disability, but because of they're just not prepared to learn. And so there are a lot of investments we can make on the front end that can make a big difference, that could reduce the prison population, reduce the number of people who are in special ed slots, reduce the number of people in emergency departments, and save a ton of money. So I think part of it is just getting ahead of the problem. You know, from, for uh, a policy perspective, uh, you know, it, it's hard when you have somebody in the emergency room and they're, they're bleeding out, then you want to put everything into that because that crisis is right in front of you. Um, the things that we're talking about are a crisis as well, but it's, it's a hidden crisis. And I think it is those kinds of things like getting the stories out to say it is equally as important to, to work with young children early on about connecting to the land, having the relationships, having the correct foods, as it is to the emergency room. But, but somehow, these crises is what calls attention. And even as we look at the, the changes in the Affordable Care Act, we're still focusing on that, that high end and we need to change the equation, as you said. We need to put more dollars in the 95% that's really, or the 80% that's really impacting health, rather than that end stage. And I think the only way we're going to do that is by continuing to get the stories out. And we need to begin to get a, a groundswell. Um, I see legislators in the audience, I, I see Representative Morikawa, back there, and what they get the call to attention is the crisis, and we don't have the voice of the community there. We need to get the voice of the community as well to say, these things are important. We need to invest in our communities. We need to invest in our children. We need to invest early on and not wait until they get to the prisons, until they get to the emergency room. Um. I'm very conflicted because as someone who believes very much in this issue, I would like to encourage everybody to just keep staying and talking about it. But <laughs> I have responsibilities as a moderator to let you know that uh, we are out of time. So thank you again very much. How about a hand for all of our panelists? So.